easiest thing to do around freedom, and again, our law, at least in this area, is not bad, is you assume capacity. Yeah, so you don't make an issue where there's no issue. And often, that's, sometimes, that's what people find, is lots of people making an issue where there's no issue. A tenancy, a right to do this, a right to make that decision, where and people are questioning it, can you make it, when, well, they've made it, they would make it, they are making it, they're telling you, and we make it a problem because of their learning disability. That, the law doesn't like that, and you need really good reasons to just take away that kind of clearly expressed freedom. Those reasons can exist, but you need good reasons. Um, the other thing the law is really good at, and again I think is a good principle, is that I might not be great at making some really particularly complex decisions, like I've helped quite a few people buy a house. Okay, now when it came to the details of buying the house, they delegated that decision to a family member or somebody they trusted. It's because they, they could say, I, yeah, I want a house, and this is what they, working out whether they were prepared to buy it, whether buying it was the right option for them, the details of that weren't for them. But what was really important is they picked who made that decision. And it's only that decision. So that's really two and three. Don't, don't assume just because my friend Karina can't make a decision about buying a house, she can't make all sorts of other everyday decisions. Buying a house is a complicated business for, for any of us, isn't it? If somebody does need that kind of help, then they get to pick who's going to do the deciding for them. Now again, there are rare but very important circumstances where who somebody might pick, you and ultimately the local authority or anybody in that person's life might want to challenge that, might say that's not right, this person is not safe or sensible. But again, if you're going to overrule somebody's preference, you better have really good reasons. A good reason is not, well, that person's their mum, and maybe, you know, maybe mums don't always know what's best. So then you've got to start working out. If, you, if the person can't pick, or if they pick somebody and you around them decide, no, you've picked that person, but you know, we have good reasons to say you can't, then you've got to effectively select somebody for them. But it's fairly obvious, I think, really, isn't it? You've got to find somebody who is likely to have that person's, and that takes us on to five, best interests at heart. If, they don't, if they've got strong reason to suspect that person is going to be thoughtless, careless, that's a good reason to not pick that person. But you also need people who have a right kind of relationship, just to gather enough information. Again, I'm always a little bit, I question, I can see the role for independent social workers and advocacy workers in extreme situations. But it's, you, you really can't live like that with a social worker or an advocate making decisions for you day by day by day because they don't know enough about you. And it goes back to, if you look at what really makes freedom work, it's love. So, in some sense, you've got to have people in your life who are paying attention. Does that make sense? You, you, can, you can send the independent advocate in who can kind of stand there with a sign saying, right, I'm going to ask some tough questions. But the independent advocate doesn't know the person. And by the time they've got to know the person, they're not independent. They've got a relationship. And it's the, so what you're doing in judging suitability, in my opinion, is you're judging between people who have relationships <coughs> with that person and who want to play the role, you can't assume people will just sign up for this. You're saying, well, who is it in practice who can take on this role? And you look at the different criteria and you balance it. I, well, I suppose what I'm arguing is that if you're, if you're looking at this as a community and where you've got social workers and local authority and maybe the NHS involved as well, then they have a duty to support people's freedom and the local authority's role in that situation is to, is to act as the kind of coordinator of a good decision around this stuff, I think. I, I say to social workers, this is your fundamental duty. That's what social workers should be doing. I don't think they always do it, interestingly. So I think it's a problem in our system. But it seems to me it's a fundamental duty of a good social worker to figure out how decisions get made when, if you like, the wheels have fallen off, when decision-making is 
not competent around an individual. I'm going to say two contradictory things. I'm not going to argue for low salaries for support workers, but I, I, in fact I think that you know the funding for support is appallingly low in this country and the way in which salaries have been pushed down for support workers is a huge, huge problem. I mean, six times as much support is provided for free anyway. So there's no relationship between how much money you pay. I mean, I can remember a story per perfectly like, I mean, I remember my friend Trevor when we were getting him out of the institution. And you said, well, who are your friends? And Trevor listed 30 members of staff at the institution. And we, and because the th what Trevor really liked was parties, uh, to try and get, find out who really liked Trevor, we held a party for Trevor. Um, and we invited all of the people he listed. All of those members of staff who were paid a lot more proper NHS salaries stood around the edge of a room a bit like this, uncomfortable and embarrassed. They weren't going to dance, play games with things that Trevor, things that Trevor really loved. One person did, Suzanne, who was, had been his support worker at the residential care home when he was, he'd been dis, he kind of discharged and then kicked out of the residential care home for challenging behaviour because he hated it, uh, and, um, and sent back to the castle, the institution. Well, Suzanne liked Trevor. That's as simple as that. She was a human being. They got on eye to eye, figured out fun stuff to do. Um, my job then, I just worked out how to support Trevor around the relationship he had with Suzanne. I mean, he, he was institutionalised so early in his life that he had lost contact with his family and friends. So this is kind of tragic thing that happens to people, particularly when they're sent into institutions. So the possibility for relationship, uh, I think, is permanently there. You, you have to go and look where it is. I, I don't have any experience that tells me there's a strong correlation between amount of money paid and possibility of relationship. One of the things we're getting badly wrong in support services is we're continuing to support people with generic staff. When getting people out of the institutions, we set up teams where people were supported by only people hand-picked for that individual. Well, that makes a big difference. So is that what's going on in your services? It doesn't seem to be going on in England at all. I can't find services that are tailoring support arrangements for individuals. Even though we know, and disabled people tell us all the time, that is the most important thing. It's more important than money, it's more important than regulations, it's more important than qualifications. It's who supports me? What kind of human being are they? Do I like them? Do they like me? So if you don't put that kind of design principle right in the heart of the way you do support, I think you're kind of screwed. Sorry, not very polite term. Yeah, I, mean, I think you will just end up with people looking embarrassed, and you can pay them twice as much, three times as much, four times as much, it won't make any difference. Because you're not asked the fundamental question, who is supporting Jack? Is it somebody Jack likes? Is it somebody who likes Jack? If you've got those two things wrong, I don't really see where you're going. I kind of think it's, it's amazing. I mean, t 20 years ago, there was this bloke called Peter Kinsella, and I joined a team that he ran, and we were talking about supported living, and supported living men you had a home of your own, and you lived with people you chose, and you were only supported by people you chose. Yeah, but none of that actually happened. No, exactly. So what you're talking about is something called residential care dressed up in Absolutely. new language. I mean, it's just a, it's such a flawed model, and, and all we've done over the last 10 years, as far as I can see, is take residential care homes and, and tart them up a bit. In my experience, it's that, you know, you can do the stuff, you know, I, you know, you know, I like things like individual budgets and these mechanisms to shift power and accountability, but it's the people that make the most difference. Whatever organisational system you have, whatever you know, system of self directed support and commissioning, it's the people. So if we don't get that bit right... Let me just uh, finish this little list. But I just want... These last two are really, really, really important as well. You know, when you set up arrangements of supported decision-making or... Um, substitute decision making where somebody's going to be it for Jack, uh, Jack's still got a right to be involved. Um, so you've got to think about that too. And you've also got to remember, and I always remember this story, when the very early days of setting up self-directed support in Scotland, and I helped uh, a young lady called Helen 
who wanted her support arrangements changed. She is a good example of what we're talking about, really. She was offered domiciliary care by the local authority, which meant, and I'm now of this age group, so no disrespect to anybody else of this age group, but domiciliary care for her as a young, attractive woman living in Scotland was women of, in their 50s and 60s coming and taking us to the shops. This did not work for her, yes? She wanted to be hanging out with women of her age group who liked the same clothes she liked, who liked doing the same things she liked. It's not complicated. It's not rocket science. And she was very clear that this wasn't working for her, but the system said, well, we only do domiciliary care. It's the only thing we can do. So we, we were able to change that by saying, well, Helen, we can take the budget for domiciliary care and give you control over it. Now, for her with the particular brain injury, she agreed that it was best that her mum would manage the budget. But she said this really important thing to me when we set this up. She said, ask me again in a year's time, because I might change my mind. Yeah? So it's the same is true around a lot of people with learning difficulties. Their capacities are growing and changing all the time. And sometimes they run the other direction as well. So you can't, this isn't a static thing. This is my mold, making mountains out of mold little slide. What am I going on about? One of the things I notice that gets in the way a lot of the time of freedom is not the person or their capacities, but it's the way in which the people around the person fall out with each other. Yes? Um, so what, what I am just sick to death of is professionals telling me, well, it's all the mum's fault. You know, she doesn't, she's not empowering enough for, she, you know. I just sick to death of the kind of disrespectful attitude towards family and community that profession. And I must have, I'm going to be honest, I mean, I know it cuts both ways, but in my experience, and I'm coming as somebody who is not a family member, but as a professional, in my experience, the bias here is very much against families from systems. I hope that's not your experience, but I, I, I do kind of meet this a lot. And um, so I'm going to tell you a little story about what I'm trying to mean here. So this is again from Scotland. I remember I was asked to help a, uh, a situation where decision making had broken down, where a young man who'd gone into genuine supportive living, he had his own house, and he had a support arrangement provided by um, an organisation where his mum was angry that things were done badly. That was her opinion, but the commissioners and the service provider thought she was being unreasonable. You know, this is just an annoying mum who keeps going on and on and on. So I said, um, well, let's look at the issues then. So I got everybody together in a room and just said, right, now what are all the things we think are a problem? And we ended up with a list of like 20 things that the mum thought was a problem. And I just facilitated the group to go through all of those issues. You know, we got to issue number 19, and Mum was right about every single one of them. The only one she wasn't right about was issue 20, and even she went, right, well, you know, okay, probably, I've gone over the top. That, to me, is so typical. Why is Mum so often right, even when she's cross and grumpy and pissing people off and maybe not behaving the way you'd ideally like? It's because she loves her son and she pays attention to what's working and what's not working in a way that many other people don't. And again, I don't try to make a huge generalisation here that, you know, I know there are families where it goes, it flips over. You know, I've worked with uh, a young woman where her father was a sexual abuser. I know there are these people out there, but that is not the norm. And we behave sometimes <laughs> as if it's the norm. It's the, that's the absolute abhorrent extreme. So making mountains out of molehills is just what I think is what we sometimes do. We, we, we take little disagreements in perspective and we turn a whole mountain out of it of disagreement. We'll spend all our time fighting with one another about what's right for Jack rather than figuring out what do we agree about and let's work from there. And, and I just think, I know it's a kind of simple thought in a way, but when we talk about freedom, it's not just our love and, uh, for the person, but it's also how we work together that's going to be really important. Because it's a social thing, by which I mean it's, it's not just one person or two people, it's a group of us collaborating to make freedom work. So these kind of things become really, really important.